Anticoagulation Principles, Warfarin, Part 2A, Mechanism of Action and Pharmacokinetics. In Part 1 of this four-part series, we talked about the history and use of warfarin. Because of the length of material in Part 2, I decided to split it up into two parts, Part 2A, which will go over the mechanism of action and pharmacokinetics of warfarin, and Part 2B, which will go over the many important drug-drug interactions involving warfarin use. In any discussion of the mechanism of warfarin, we must first start off with the coagulation cascade. The liver produces many coagulation factors, shown in Roman numerals, which are activated. They cascade downward until a fibrin clot is formed. It is important to note that the presence of vitamin K is necessary to activate the coagulation factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. The way warfarin works is that it interferes with the enzyme that produces activated vitamin K and thus will prevent activation of four important coagulation factors, thus leading to an anticoagulated state. Warfarin antagonizes the synthesis of the vitamin K-dependent clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. It does so by interfering with the production of vitamin K. Vitamin K is an essential dietary factor that functions as a cofactor in the activation of the clotting factors. Vitamin K activates clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10 via carboxylation. In the diagram below, we'll see how this all happens. First, oxidized vitamin K, or vitamin K epoxide, is converted by the enzyme vitamin K epoxide reductase, or VCOR, to vitamin K1. Vitamin K1 is then converted by the quinone reductase enzyme to reduce vitamin K, or vitamin KH2, which is the active form of vitamin K. The carboxylase enzyme then uses this active form of vitamin K to convert inactive clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10 to the active clotting factors that have been car carboxylated. Carboxylation is required for a calcium-dependent conformational change in the clotting protein that promotes binding to cofactors on the phospholipid surfaces. Warfarin is a vitamin K antagonist. In the diagram below, you can see where warfarin works. It inhibits the enzyme vitamin K epoxide reductase, also known as VCOR. Thus, downstream, preventing the carboxylation of the inactive clotting factors to the active clotting factors. It inhibits the hepatic activation of four vitamin K-dependent clotting factors, as well as endogenous anticoagulants pro protein C and protein S. Warfarin inhibits vitamin K epoxide reductase, the enzyme that converts oxidized vitamin K epoxide to the reduced active form of vitamin K. Thus, warfarin interferes with the production of vitamin K-dependent clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. Vitamin K is found in certain foods. Therefore, foods containing high amounts of vitamin K can bypass warfarin's effect, leading to a greater coagulated state. You can see in the diagram where food is administered and providing vitamin K1, which then eliminates warfarin's effect on the carboxylase, providing a coagulated active clotting factors and a coagulated state. We'll talk more about this in a few minutes. In addition, warfarin inhibits carboxylation of the regulatory anticoagulant proteins C and S and thereby have the potential to be a procoagulant. So let's review the mechanism of action of warfarin. The liver produces coagulation factors that are activated in a cascade manner until the thrombin clot is produced. 
the activation of these clotting factors is dependent on the presence of vitamin K. Warfarin inhibits the activation of vitamin K via the V-core enzyme, resulting in the absence of active vitamin K and clotting factors and leading to an anticoagulated state. The ingestion of high amounts of vitamin K in the diet can override the V-core enzyme and produce enough active vitamin K to reduce warfarin's effect. The onset of action for warfarin is 36 to 72 hours. Full anticoagulant effect is not seen for five to seven days. Steady state effect on the INR takes 10 to 14 days. Warfarin's onset is not immediate since the drug interrupts only the formation of new clotting factors. Existing clotting factors formed prior to warfarin are unaffected and must be eliminated from the system. Therefore, the onset of the warfarin effect is dependent on the half-lives of the existing vitamin K-dependent clotting factors. This table lists the half-lives of the four clotting factors. It takes about four half-lives to eliminate each one of the clotting factors. Factor seven has the shortest half-life of six hours, so it is eliminated quickly, within one to two days. However, it will take a longer time to eliminate the other clotting factors who own much longer half-lives. So overall, it will take at least four days to begin to see the full effect of warfarin suppressing the clotting factors. Let's talk a little bit about the pharmacokinetics of warfarin. Warfarin is a racemic mixture of two optically active isomers, the R and S forms, in equal proportion. It's important to note that the S isomer is three to four times more potent than the R isomer. As far as absorption, it's rapidly absorbed from the GI tract and it reaches maximal plasma concentrations in about 90 minutes. It has a high bioavailability. With regards to distribution, it has a small volume of distribution of 0.14 liter per kilogram. And it's also important to note that warfarin is highly plasma protein bound, mainly to albumin, about 97 to 99%. With regards to metabolism, the major route of elimination is by liver metabolism. It accumulates in the liver. Warfarin is metabolized by the cytochrome or CYP P450 enzymes, 2C9 primarily, but also 2C19, 2C18, 1A2, and 3A4. The S isomer is metabolized by CYP2C9, the R isomer by CYP1A2 and 3A4. It's metabolized to inactive hydroxyl metabolites primarily and less to alcohols. These metabolites have minimal activity and the metabolites are excreted into the urine. The half-life of warfarin is 36 to 42 hours, about 1.5 days. Let's move on and talk about the factors that affect warfarin kinetics. Factors such as genetics, disease states, drugs, and diet can significantly alter the pharmacokinetics and clinical effect of warfarin. Each person presents a unique set of circumstances. Therefore, dosing should be individualized. What are the genetic influences, often called genomics? There's a common mutation in the gene coding for the cytochrome P450 2C9 hepatic microsomal enzyme. This results in a patient's impaired ability for metabolism of the more potent S isomer of warfarin. This mutation is independently responsible for reduced warfarin requirements by 17 to 37%. There is also a hereditary increased warfarin sensitivity that's associated with genetic polymorphism of the V-core vitamin K reductase enzyme complex subunit. It causes an increased warfarin sensitivity seen in 89% of Asian Americans. So these patients need lower warfarin doses overall. It occurs in 37% of European Americans and 14% of African Americans who need higher warfarin doses overall. 
Now let's talk about some disease state influences. Thyroid disease. Stable levothyroxine patients in a euthyroid state should be treated like patients without thyroid issues. However, hypothyroid patients initiated on levothyroxine or having the dose increased may require warfarin dose reduction due to increased clotting factor catabolism and increased warfarin binding affinity. Hypermetabolic states produced by fever or hyperthyroidism increases the catabolism of vitamin K dependent clotting factors and thus will increase warfarin's effect. What about fluid retention? Fluid retention reduces blood flow through the liver and decreases metabolism of warfarin, thereby increasing the warfarin effect. It's also important to note that patients that are admitted with acute heart failure may initially require a reduction in warfarin dose, but dose requirements may increase as the patient diuresis and clinically improves. Liver disease. Liver disease potentiates the response to warfarin through the impaired synthesis of coagulation factors. An acute illness. The acute illness in general may elevate the INR, especially in those patients with fever and or infections. Let's talk about the dietary influences. Dietary vitamin K, which is derived predominantly from phyloquinones in plant material, can cause potential fluctuations in warfarin therapy. Vitamin K in food can bypass warfarin's effect on the V-core enzyme and activate clotting factors. You can see in this diagram where warfarin works on the V-core enzyme system. By giving food or vitamin K1, this can bypass the warfarin effect. You can then see that the carboxylase then is in operation which converts the inactive clotting factors and converts them to the carboxylated active clotting factors, thus bypassing warfarin's effect. Here are some of the foods that have an impact on increasing the vitamin K intake. Vitamin K is found in broccoli, cabbage, lettuce, kale, spinach, scallions, Brussels sprouts, mustard and collard greens, green tea, canola oil, soybeans, and leafy green vegetables. It's recommended that a constant intake of vitamin K containing foods is advisable. It's important to remember that overall, it's hard to change the diet enough to cause a significant change in the INR. However, patients consuming large portions of green vegetables or vitamin K containing supplements while following weight reduction diets may have an increased intake of dietary vitamin K that is sufficient enough to reduce the anticoagulant response to warfarin. Most patients admitted to the hospital are not eating and they are not receiving any vitamin K intake, so it's easy for them to have a high INR upon admission. It's unusual to have someone admitted to the hospital with an INR that is not elevated. Hospitalized patients receiving antibiotics and IV fluids without vitamin K supplementation will have reduced dietary vitamin K1 intake, which potentiates the effect of warfarin. Some juices may have an effect on warfarin. Cranberry juice. The FDA recommends to avoid drinking cranberry juice or eating cranberry products while taking warfarin. This is controversial as other studies contradict this. It could it be a dose-related phenomena? As far as grapefruit juice, grapefruit juice interferes with the CYP3A4 metabolism of the weaker R isomer, so it has little effect on the INR. In part 2a, we explained the mechanism of action of warfarin, reviewed the significant kinetic parameters of warfarin and how the drug is metabolized, and we outlined important genetic factors, disease states, and diets that affect warfarin therapy. In part 2b of this four-part series on warfarin anticoagulation, we will describe warfarin's significant drug interactions that increase and decrease its effect. So stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in to watch this installment of the PharmEasy Tutor. I hope you learned something that you could use at school or in practice. 
If you'd like to continue to see more of these types of tutorials on YouTube, please make sure to click on the subscribe button below to change it from red to gray. Also, if you like this video, I would appreciate it if you can click on the thumbs up icon below to change the color to blue. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to add them in the comment section below or share this site with someone else. Stay tuned to the Farm Easy Tutor channel for more lectures in the upcoming weeks. So until next time, remember to take it easy.